tries to present it in the gospel of God concerning his son. And the purpose of these nights together is just to study again what the gospel is. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. Not ask you believe it, but it is the power of salvation under God, uh, of God on the salvation to everyone that believes that it doesn't have any power in it, that its power is not limited till you have to you believe it, but the power is in it to create belief itself. And so you might believe everything the Bible teaches about prophecy and go to hell. Or you might believe everything the Bible teaches about holy living and go to hell. Or you might believe everything the Bible teaches about any of the other teachings of the Word of God, as important as they are. But if you miss out on the gospel, if you base your faith and your hope of eternal life in the life to come on anything except the truth as it is in the gospel, why you do so to the law of your soul. And so whether it's dry or whether it pumps up this generation of people who look for a thrill or not, we're not concerned. We are concerned trying to be helpful to people in this day when everybody's preaching the gospel and everybody's preaching it different. When one fellow says this and the other fellow says that, and where if you listen to preaching, you'll go nutty as a pancake if you try to unscramble it. So everybody's got a doctor. And everybody's got a hymn, and everybody's got a dance, and everybody's got a passion that carries its habits, and everybody's got a hobby, spiritual or otherwise, and none of us much are much interested in that that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So tonight we want to begin studying with you after having spent last night in just introducing the fact that the gospel is God's gospel. It's not yours. It's not the gospel according to Baptists. It's not the gospel according to Methodists. It's not the gospel according to John Wesley. It's not the gospel according to Calvin. It's not the gospel according to anybody else. It's the gospel of God. And it concerns his son, uh, who his son is, and what his son did, and what God's doing now. That is the gospel. That's God's good news. And we sought to establish the truth last night that eternal life, as we read in John chapter 17, is to know the only true God. That if you do not know by experience, that is, by experiencing His power in your life, the only true God, that doesn't make any difference what church you belong to or what doctrines you believe or anything else. You're headed for hell. You're yet in your sins unless you know, not your mama knows, or the old folks in your church know, or your grandpappy believe, but unless you know yourself by experiencing his power in your own life, the only true God and his son Jesus Christ, that you're still a lost hell down sinner. That's his sin. And so, where the Scripture talks about the only true God, it recognizes the fact that people have God. Everybody's got him a God, you know. And the biggest trouble in getting a man saved is to kill his God and leave him an orphan so he'll seek the only true God. Now, when you go killing a fellow's God, he'll get a crowbar and start fighting. And I've been in many a scrap. Not from the bootleggers, not from the fellow that runs the filling station, the plows in the field, but religious people who uh, seek to cloak themselves in their own righteousness will get a crowbar in one hand and a shotgun in another when you go to killing their God. Well, you can't have two gods, and if you've got two tonight, you've really got none. And the only two gods that could possibly anybody have the one you created yourself or the one who's revealed in the Bible. And with that, that the way to know about God and to find out who he is is to be honest 
and let him reveal himself to us. We are utterly shut up to that. Now, a man can't find out about God if God won't disclose himself to us. Uh, somebody says, well, a man can't find God. Well, you can't let God looking for you. If God's running from you, you'll never catch up with him. A man cannot by searching find God. You can't discover God. God has to reveal himself to you. Now, that's true. Now, I don't know whether you believe that or not, because that's contrary to the preaching of the last 40 years. It's all about what you do. You do this, you do that, you do the other, and if you do this, and if you do that, well, God will do that. And we fix it. God waits to decide what you do before he makes the move, and that makes God little and you big. And this generation likes that, and just one thing wrong with that is that it ain't so. It ain't so. God's not waiting to see what you're going to do. You better be interested in what God's going to do. Now, that's right, dear one. Now, if we let God reveal himself to us, we, we, we can find out God, and we can find out about God. But that's the only way we can. In other words, God has to reveal himself to you. You are shut up to that. If you go through this life, if you go through this life, and God never reveals himself to you, you're going to go to hell when you die. You're shut up to that. You're just helpless and hopelessly bound for hell, and I am too, if God is not pleased to reveal himself as to who he is and what he does to you, there's no hope at all for you. But that's what Christianity is. And that's what the Bible's about, and that's what God has done, and that's what God is doing, and that's the good news of God. Now, last night we tried to see that we must learn who God is if we're going to have any, any ability whatsoever to believe and act upon his acts. We found out that he to understanding as much as we are able by the help of God to understand any of the works of God, the key to that is to first find out what kind of a God we've got. And the Bible tells us God says of himself that he's almighty. He's got all power. God says of himself that he's eternal. He had no beginning. He'll have no ending. God says of himself that he's holy, that his spirit is against the, the material. And then it, the Bible says so many things about his acts, that he's righteous and he has shows mercy and he shows grace and he's patient and he's long-suffering and he's uh, this and that. So many of the different characteristics of the person of Almighty God. Now, last night we introduced you to the way God does. We read to you from Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5, and Galatians 1 and 15, and showed you that it's a question of God doing for you, not you doing for God. Salvation's not something you do. Salvation's something God does and you receive. Salvation's of the law. The only part a sinner has is to receive that which God gives, and he doesn't receive that except as a hungry man grasping for bread, or as a thirsty man grasping for water. Now, there isn't any merit in that. We found out, I tried to just to whet your appetite by saying that God works down to you, that salvation is God working something far and in you. You can't do that for you that God does, and you can't do that in you that God does, and therefore you can't save yourself, can you? You can't save yourself. Now, man either needs to be saved from the just penalty he's incurred himself by violating God's holy law, or he don't. If he does, then there are just two possible ways that that man can be saved. He can save himself or somebody else who has to save him. The Bible, if it's clear on anything, it's clear that man is a sinner. He's a sinner because as an act, an act of his own will, he has sinned against the holy law of God. He's to blame for his sin. The Bible nowhere says that God is to blame for the mess that a man's in. 
The Bible is very clear that if anybody sees, it'll be God's fault. The Bible is very clear that if anybody is damned, it'll be his own fault. The Bible says that God is the author of holiness and that man is the author of sin. The Bible says that all holiness comes from God. The Bible says that all sin comes from man. The Bible says by the disobedient act of one man, sin came into the world and thus came death. The Bible, therefore, doesn't say that sinners are to the pity, it says they are to the grace. The Bible doesn't regard sin as being sinful. The Bible says that sin is a disease or a misfortune. The Bible says that sin regards sin as a disease or a misfortune. It, it, it regards it as guilt, and the Bible says that men are guilty and thus need to be punished, and God will punish them, and men need to be saved from the just punishment that God is going to meet out to them apart from the, the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, either salvation is of God or it's of man. It can't be of both. We found out last night that God can either act according to his will or according to yours. And by that he simply meant that God has to do his will or he has to do yours. You can't mix them up. What takes place takes place because God wills it or it takes place because man wills it. It can't take place by both. Somebody got to run this out there. Somebody got to start it. The Bible teaches that whatever takes place takes place because God wills it. And this generation says that whatever takes place takes place because I will it. And the Bible of this generation of people, one or the other, are wrong. Now, if the gospel is God's good news, and if it's talking about what God has done and is doing, to save sinners, I thought it'd be well, with that introduction last night, taking into cognizance the fact that God can either act according to his good pleasure, do what he sees best, or do what man sees best. I thought it'd be nice tonight if we had a look at the covenant of grace that is, is of course, found everywhere in the Bible. I've written here on the blackboard a brief outline of what we'll be occupied with tonight through Friday night. And I want to read two passages of Scripture. The first is the one we read last night in John's Gospel, chapter 17, and emphasize a part of those verses that we read but did not emphasize last night. Now tonight we want to begin the study the covenant of grace. I believe before I read the scripture, I'll emphasize on the blackboard here two truths. The covenant of grace is the oldest covenant in, in, in time of eternity. Just then, two covenants made. One is the covenant made between God and Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that was the covenant of work. Adam was created innocent. He was created holy. He was created with a liability of disobeying. God didn't make him disobey, and Adam was promised salvation if he continued in the state of holiness. Now, the Bible says that Adam sinned and lost his holy estate. And the Bible says that I was in Adam, and you were in Adam, and that when Adam sinned, I sinned. Well, you say, I don't understand that. Well, nobody, I suppose, does. But that's what the Bible says. Now, you do not show any evidence that you're a child of God if you buck everything in the Bible you cannot understand. Now, let me repeat that. People tell me, boy, I've had thousands of them, but I, I just will not accept that. I can't understand it. I just know God wouldn't do that way. I just can't understand it. Well, of course you wouldn't. You hate God. You are not submissive to God. You, you've never been, you've never bowed to his lordship in your life. He's not your God. You've got a little God you create. Now, bless your dear heart, the mind of a man whose mind has been enlightened by the Holy Ghost and whose will has been energized by the Spirit and who's been born again, bless your dear heart, he's got a conception of God that makes him understand that God's ways are above our ways. And 
we don't have to understand what God uh, does. We just have to obey it. Just have to believe it. Now, the Bible is plain that when Adam sinned, I sinned. And therefore, under the covenant of God, every human being, you and you and you and you and me and everybody who ever has lived from Adam on down to the last man that ever lived, has failed to keep the covenant between God and man. And therefore, he is liable to the death penalty in hell that the law says is to everybody that breaks the law of God. But before God made a covenant with Adam, that Adam broke and that you and I broke with him, God made a covenant with himself. Now, any covenant that God makes between himself and man is going to fail. Let me tell you why. Because man thinks. And whatever man has anything to do in the spiritual world, he'll run. You know that so. And the only covenant God's ever made with man went down the, the river because man failed. And thus man has no claim whatsoever on God. And so before there was any and before there was a start, the Bible tells us over and over again, assumes it on every page, that God himself made an agreement with himself. And the scripture calls that covenant or that agreement that God made with himself, not with you, but with himself. He told himself and agreed with himself, the three persons of the Godhead. God is Father, and God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit, and a meeting. And they agreed to do something. And each one of them undertook to do a certain thing. Do you see it? And that's what the Scriptures call the covenant of grace. Now, I've got the outline of the activity of Godhead in this covenant of grace. We're going into it, but let's read here in John chapter 17 and see how this agreement or this covenant is assumed. For instance, in this one passage of Scripture, follow me carefully now in the open Bibles as we start with verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Now I wonder when that hour was decided. The other person, see it then? There's an hour that's come now. When was it decided? This is his death he's talking about. Now when was that hour six? He says it's come. Did you know about it? I know about it. It's come now. When was that hour six? And who fixed it? Who fixed it? The hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Now follow me, Captain. See here is an agreement. This is soon. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh. Now when did the Father give the Son authority over all flesh? There's a meeting. There's an agreement. There's a transaction that the Lord said took place back down somewhere, don't you see? It? That's clear, isn't it? That he should give eternal life. There's an agreement. The Father did something for the Son in order for the Son to do something for somebody else. See, there's an agreement, you see. You say, I'll do something, so you can do something. That's an agreement, isn't it? You say, all right, I'll do that, and you do that. And here's an agreement between the Father and the Son. Let's watch it. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh. So sometime, and he turns here somewhere, this scripture assumes that the Father gave his Son authority over every human being that ever lived. And that he did it in order that his son might give eternal life. And then, watch it, there's some more of the agreement. That his son might give eternal life to, now read this text, as many as thou hast given him. Somewhere, the, the Godhead had a meeting. And the Father says, I'm going to give you these people. Isn't that that? Isn't that that? And, and he says, I'm going to give them to you. 
And I want you to give me eternal life. You see, there's an agreement, isn't it? There's a covenant. There's a definite number of people involved. He's to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. You see, there's a covenant. The Father says, I got some people here, and I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to turn them over to you. And I expect you to give them eternal life. So you see? And in order to do that, I've given you authority over every human being in all of this world. So you see? Now you boys and girls, smarter than you older folks, you've already seen. That language is clear as the word on a dog's face. They had an agreement, didn't they? Is that clear? They had an agreement. Now, as this in verse 3, and this is life eternal. In verse 2, the Son to give eternal life to some people, and this is life eternal. We talked about this last night, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And then verse 4, still on this cup, I have glorified thee on the earth. Watch it. I have finished the what? What does it say? Anybody awake? Talk back to me. The what? Word. The work which thou gavest me to do. Somewhere, somewhere, the Father gave the Son a word to do. That's clear, isn't it? Huh? That's clear. Now, in the 13th chapter of, of the least of uh, Hebrews, we have, so far as I know, and I think I, this is right, I believe I know this, as far as I know, the only time in the entire Bible that we have the expression, the covenant of grace, or the everlasting covenant, this, in, in, in just plain language, it's assumed in so many of the scriptures as we're going to see. But here in Hebrews 13 and 20, it's named, you see. Now, let me pause to, 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 to stick a pen down here. I want to ask you something now. I'm not preaching to you. I want to help you if I can. I, I don't have strength enough to put myself into it too much. My mind's not working very clear. I'm sort of stumbling along. But I want to ask you this simple down to earth, hard and harmony and grits question. I'm going to ask you that. Now you listen to me. Is it true of you that you have a hard time getting anything out of studying the Bible? It is for most folks. I have people tell me, Brother Bond, I don't know how to study the Bible. I read it, but don't mean much. I'm going to help you if you'll let me. If you'll start studying the Bible where we're starting tonight, trying to find out what God proposes to do and how he proposes to do it, the Bible will open up. If you don't, you just believe most anything that the latest fellow you hear talk says, because I can take the Bible and prove your doctrine. Whatever it is, you got some scriptures for that. And I can take the Bible and prove mine. I got some scriptures for mine. And if you let me handle them, I can make them stick to You see what I mean? Well, I think we're here and we have different views of different things. Now, this preacher says this, and our church teaches that, and that church teaches that. And you ask me which one's right, and I'll tell you, ain't that one of them. We've all got too far from the truth. Now, but that's right. And none of you got nothing to crow about from us. Mm -hmm. Me and That's right. But you can prove your doctrine by the Bible. And I can prove my doctrine, Brother Biden. Hmm? And that's why we've got about 300 different denominations sects. They all got them a doctrine. They can prove it. 
course, in proving it, they have to cut the rest of the Bible all to pieces, but they just cut her up. But one doctrine in the Bible isn't true at the expense of another. One truth isn't true if it violates another truth, is it? And if you want to get to the truth of the gospel, I'm telling you now. Somebody tells me, I read the Bible through a dozen times. Well, you've just well been reading the funny paper. That's not the way to read the Bible. Somebody tells me, I read a chapter every day. Well, I'd rather read a good novel. Get more out of it. Get more out of it. You don't learn the Bible that way. This Bible's not a book to be read chapter after chapter. Not like a newspaper. This Bible isn't worth a dime except as it reveals to poor sinners like you and me the will of God, the Word of God, as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If I find out what the Bible teaches about what God and Father will to do, but the God this Bible talks about can do anything he sets out to do. If I can just find out what he says I'm going to do, I'm getting somewhere. Huh? I'm getting somewhere. Do you see what I mean? Now, that, that, that's the truth still one. I know what I'm talking about. I've been sick for three weeks and been home. I have people... Uh, who love me and others found out I was sick and they'd come to see me and I had a Methodist Sunday school teacher. I knew that seen before, but my sister's a Methodist and she's Sunday school teacher. And uh, 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 they came to see me and he said, isn't there any chance on earth in this city of you or somebody starting a Bible class? He said, I haven't been saved very long. And said, they put me in charge of teaching some intermediate boys. And he said, I don't know one thing about the Bible. And said, don't know how to study it. And said, those little boys, they'd be better off stay at home instead of sitting under me. And said, the pastor don't preach nothing. And he don't. He just gives book reviews. That's right. And, and he said, I go to prayer meeting that teach the Bible. said, don't teach nothing. And he said, I wish I knew how to study the Bible. He said, I read it, but... Just goes in one ear and out the other. And, and uh, a Presbyterian came to see him. And he had the same thing. And some Baptists. It's everywhere. The dead people, the priest tells them to study the Bible. But you can't study the Bible like you do in newspaper. This Bible, you can prove anything under God's shining sun you want to. If you just hop, skip, and jump. And... That's right. You can't. Huh? And, bud, if you think I'm alive, you go to any city of a million people and got three of the least 300 different denominational churches. All of them got them a little pet doctor. Oh, he's just knocking a home run. Isn't that right? That's right. That's right. But this, dear ones, will help you. This, dear ones, will help you. Now, listen to me. If we miss out on everything, we want to find out what God in this covenant that he made with himself set out to do and how he proposes to get it done. And that'll open up your Bible, brother. It'll do it. It'll do it. Now here in Hebrews 13, let me read. I don't charge any extra for that, but I just took time out to say it. I'm not criticizing. I simply know that the plaint of God's people nearly everywhere is the one thing they're not learning anything about in church is the Word of God. We learn about the GA program, the WMA program, and the Christian Network League, and the BTU, and the convention, and everything under the shining sun, but the Sun School teachers themselves on the way from Adam about the Word of God. Now, that's right, now. We need to study this book. And I'm trying to help you about the, if you can get the gospel right, you'll actually get right on a lot of other things. But if you go wrong at the, at the main thing, you'll be wrong the whole way. Huh? That's right. 
and I want to help you understand what, what the gospel is. Now here in Hebrews 13, verse 20, here we have, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the what kind of cup? The everlasting cup. Well, that means that it's going to last quite a while now. It means that my Lord Jesus died in order to fulfill his agreement that he made with the Father in the covenant. In other words, here's what it means. In the covenant that God made with Abraham, the WMA program, and the Christian Leopard League, and the BTU, and the convention, and everything in the shining sun, but the sun still teaches themselves on the way from Adam about the Word of God. Now that's right, now. We need to study this book. And I'm trying to help you. About the, if you can get the gospel right, you'll likely get right on a lot of other things. But if you go wrong, it's, just, it's the main thing, you'll be wrong the whole way you want. Huh? That's right. And I want to help you understand what, what the gospel is. Now here in Hebrews 13, verse 20, here we have, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the what kind of cup? The everlasting. Well, that means that it's going to last quite a while now. It means that my Lord Jesus died in order to fulfill his agreement that he made to the Father in the covenant. See? In other words, here's what it means. It's a covenant that God made with itself. God had a will. He said, I want things done. I want something accomplished. And the son said, all right, I'll do that which will make your will. And the Holy Spirit said, I'll do that which will take what you do in your life and death and resurrection. I'll bring it down in the fire to the people that God wills to be saved. Now that's what God's doing. That's what God's doing. Now listen to me a little while tonight. I don't know where you'll get all this now, Ed, but you've already, you already have this. Now listen to, listen to me. If, I, if I'm not getting in the way, I don't like it. And if you're talking, if you're following me, all right, if you're not, we'll stop. Say, oh, wait, go back over that again. What do you mean by that something? We're having a Bible conference that's sitting in the up, and we're here to learn. Isn't that right? And you just feel free. Just ask me. If I don't know, I'll let you preach it. And there's a whole lot I don't know. Now, when I was young as you are, I knew everything, but I don't know everything now. I <laughs> you know, that's right. The older you get, the less you know. Isn't that right? Some of you older men. That's the God. <laughs> <laughs> boy, boy, you should have come to me and I'm about 22, 3 years old. I'm telling you, you thought that fellow was a smart guy, I was. But life has a way of knocking some of that foolishness out of you, don't it? And you learn that when you don't know as much you thought you did. <laughs> That's right. I'm not ashamed to say I don't know. Which of you rather the world would be wrong? By a dog? You rather the dog come to the world? Or is it wrong by a blind tape? Or you? Who do you think you do a better job of running things? Dog? Or just leaving up the tape? Or let you run? <laughs> now that. I'm glad the Bible teaches that God is absolutely overall. I'm glad the Bible teaches, and this isn't fatalism. This isn't blind chance. I'm glad that God teaches that nothing takes place 
that he doesn't either personally direct or allow to take place. Now, that's what the Bible teaches. That's the gospel. Now, I don't think you could make a very good job of running things. And I'm tickled to death, sister, that salvation's in the hands of God. Not in your hands. And not in the hands of blind faith. Aren't you? And I'm glad to pick up this book. And get it on every page. If you look at part, you see this covenant understood that I read to you about. It just makes the Bible mean something and unravels the thing. It shows you that this old world is not rocking along by chance. That this world is not in the hands of the dead. That this world is not in the hands of man. This world is in the hands of God. And it'll show you that salvation of the sinner is not in the hands of a blind faith, and it's not in the hands of the sinner, it's in the hands of God. I have people all over America, they say, oh boy, I don't believe what you preach when I say that God decides who will be saved. God decides who will be saved. And he decided who will be saved in this cup. When he told his son that he'd given a people. And the son said he'd die for him. And the spirit said he'd apply the work of his son. Well, somebody says, I don't like that. I do. I believe that if God Decides who will be saved. More people will be saved than his men. Because I believe it's left up to man. Nobody to saved. And I prove that by the scripture. And I'm glad since man can't save himself. And God can save the sinner. I'm glad that this business is in the hands of God. Because he's wiser than I am. And the Bible's mighty plain that he doesn't get one bit of pleasure out of anybody going to hell. Do you see? Now, in the covenant of grace, whereby the Lord Jesus agreed to shed his blood in return for being given a people at the hands of the Father, the Spirit said he'd make that special. The fine. That the one God, the real just one, they're not three God, God. One God acting as God, as the will. That same God as some did a word. That same God who the Spirit abides the word. And so, these little signs, you see, Jesus says that ain't so. God. God. Do you see it? And something else, dear one. Listen to me now. It's not that we've got one God. Now watch it. Press the day preaching. Stop this online, please. Press the day preaching. Is that we've got one God. And then we've got Jesus. And then we've got the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says we've got one God. God is God. God is God. And God is Holy Ghost. The Bible says there's one God. But in redemption, in the saving of the soul of a sinner, God acts in three ways. In one capacity, he acts as having a will. In another, he acts as dying. In another, he acts find that word. What I'm trying to say is we don't have one God and then Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We've got God as Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You understand that? If you do, come up here and stand on your head. Huh? You don't understand that. That's what Scripture teaches, isn't it? Isn't that right? But I take a little time on this because, beloved, we're in danger of picking 
God took away from our law. But, and, we, and I get, I see the little signs in the radio preacher talking about Jesus said. No, he don't. God say. In the salvation of the town, listen to me. God has the will that he be God has the word that he be saved. God has to buy that word before he's saved. That's right. Now, sometimes people say, I don't believe that. I don't believe God has to do it all. You ever heard anybody preaching that God does his part and I up you do your part? Any of you ever heard that? That's the blackest lie I've ever born in here. That's right. Now, as by that, you understand me to say that the sinner is to do nothing. You're wrong. What I'm saying is he can do nothing to save himself. You say, mustn't the sinner do something? Yes, sir. He must receive. You see? But that means salvation. That's receiving salvation. Do I make myself clear? Why, I hear it all over this country now, brother. Well, he does the God's done his part. Now he's waiting for you to do your part. Well, just what is your part? Or if it's the part of saving, you will run. If you understand me to believe that the old tenant is just sitting over here, and he's just waiting for God to come along, knocking him in the head, and get up, God, you will hate it. I'm not preaching that. Nobody will ever say it. Part of the action of that is to see that God saves. That action is God. That's the saving. I'm simply saving that Christians don't teach that God does part of the saving, and the rest of it won't work unless you do your part. That's not so. God has to do it all. Is that right? That's right. Let me see if I can hear the truth. Yes, a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread, and your wife cooks the bread, and it's all fixed up food. Now, you can say that you can enjoy that bread without you doing anything. That's the way it is. But what do you have a little loaf of bread if your wife says two thirds is fair enough, and that's just for some of you to entertain? Well, now, but we've been hearing for a long time now that God does all he can do to save you. Now he's waiting for you to do the rest. Am I lying? Have you heard preaching like that? That's just not so. Now, salvation is not of you plus uh, God plus you. It's of God. You see? Salvation is something God provides. It's all of God. And all on earth, you can do without that little bread that if your wife cooks it. You say, get it bread. If you're hungry, you eat it. You didn't make the bread, did you? Huh? You just receive from somebody else. I don't believe that. I believe the sinner's got to do his part. Well, just what part would you do? Would you do the front part, or the middle part, or the last part? What would you do? Huh? Now, don't get mad at me, but that's what the preach today. The preach. Is that right? That's what the preach. I ain't going to trust too much in something you and God together do. I want to find out what God's God. I believe I could go be pretty safe in putting all of my hope in what God got. But I don't want to trust nothing I have anything to do with. Huh? Do you? Have you received from God his gracious gift? Or have you had something to do with it? God did part of it and you did the rest. That's dangerous stuff. People say, I say right now, I don't believe that this is about God got to do it all. I believe man got to do his part. And if I believe you're preaching the sinners in the hands of God, it's up to God whether it's the kingdom or not. And it's possible to him whether he'll do mercy for them or not. But he's got to be an
And they never had problems. And they say, I have been just the man. I have been just the man. Well, he was a And I say, all right, man. let's call the prayer meeting. You don't believe my picture, but salvation is tenderous in the hands of God. That no sin on the table unless God arranged him and awakened him and gives them a purity and energizes his skill and inspires them to want to be holy. But that's a prayer meeting. And of course, the old doctrine now that it's up to man that anybody on earth can be saved. He's just doing his thing. He will just make up his mind. All right. Just have a prayer meeting. It's all the presence of
find the Bible. Nobody will ever be able to repent to the fine God of sin. And the Bible speaks to nobody else to be able to believe to the fine God of sin. The Bible speaks to nobody else to repent to the fine God of sin. The Bible speaks to nobody else to repent to the Lord to the fine God of sin.
to do what? To do the will of the Father. Now turn to John 6. So you just take you just this another minute or two. Once you get these scriptures, John 6, begin reading, for instance, at verse 37 of John chapter 6. If you got it there now, John chapter 6. Follow me carefully. Jesus is talking. E double L O. That the Father did what? Give it to whom? The Lord said the Father gave some people to him. Is that right? Huh? You believe that? I don't believe that. Well, that's what the Bible says. Now, do you understand that? No. It's too big for me, but there it is. It? All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out far. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the who? The will of who? Him that sent me. That's clear, isn't it? God as Father had a will. And because God had a will, the Son came. And he came to do what? The will of the Father. Huh? I want to find out what the will of the Father is. You see? Huh? All right. So we find out what it is by reading the next verse. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, and many of them should have lived. I could lose nothing, but should do what? Should raise it up again at the last day. Isn't that precious? Isn't that precious? Now let's turn to our opening text and read it, and then we'll go home. John chapter 17. The Father's got a will. I'm glad something's going to be done. Now, if it would make one thing clear, that if we let God tell us about himself, one thing will be settled with us. Anything he sets out to do, he's able to do it. Do you believe that? Huh? Anything the Father sets out to do, he can do it. you believe it? But praise God. <laughs> This full of the back of Jesus sitting the devil safe tell him to go back to hell. God's will's gonna be done. Huh? That fatalism? No, that's faith in God. Huh? That's a big God, you know. I can't do everything I want to do, but God can. But I did too I've done everything I set out to do, but God ain't gonna fail. I'm glad it's because God wills that some people be saved. But he sent his son to them. And you know this encourages me. You say, well, I wonder if there's any hope for me. Well, I'm encouraged to believe that anybody could be saved. There no not be any. Well, I'm not. But I've seen the reason why. Anybody couldn't be saved because the Bible is very plain that he sent the Son to do something that would enable him to save somebody. I don't see why I might not be one of those. It's for a Jew. Huh? Now, if, if I read in the Bible where he sent down here not save anybody in particular, that wouldn't be very encouraging. But the scriptures we're going to learn are very clear. He came down here to save somebody particular. He came down here actually to do that which will enable God to actually save. Not just make it possible for him to save, but to actually save. You see what I mean? And the scriptures say that that number is, is numberless. 
more than a man can know. And I believe that take the scripture, I believe I can take the scripture and prove to you that heaven is a whole lot bigger place than hell. And more people are going to be saved than lost. I'm very optimistic about it. But I also take the same scripture and show you that everybody that's ever going to be saved, God determined to save them. And Jesus came down here and shed his blood in their stead. You see? And that they're saved because God set out to save them. And because he sent his son to do that which had to be done so he could save them. Not in order to get him in the notion of saving. And God preaching, if I can find in the Bible, where he came to save some, I have every reason to believe that I might be one of them. See what I mean? 